so nice to see so many people and many familiar faces here tonight. Welcome. I'm Dana Birdie, and we are having a panel about girls' education in Afghanistan. So um, what we decided to call this panel is Seven Million Reasons for Optimism and Hope. We think it's a good counterspin to the latest news coming out of Afghanistan, so we'd like to tell you a little bit more about that. First, I'm going to introduce Amy Goodman, who will be the moderator, and she will also introduce the rest of us panelists. Um, after we complete our talk, each of us will speak for a few minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A from Amy, and then a Q&A from the audience. So I'm thrilled, I'm absolutely thrilled that Amy Goodman could be with us here tonight. It's such an honor to be able to introduce her. She's a hero to many people around the world, as you probably know. She is the host of Democracy Now!, which is broadcast around the world um, on the radio and also via internet and satellite and TV. Um, she has won many, many, many awards, so many that she asked me not to read all of them to you, so no. I'll honor her request. Um, but I do want to mention a couple more things about her background that I think are important to know. One is that she's won the Alternative to the Nobel Prize Award. And the description of this prize is called the Right to Livelihood Award. The description descri says that it's for developing an innovative model of truly independent grassroots political journalism that brings to millions of people alternative voices that are often excluded by the mainstream media. She is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, including Standing Up to the Madness, Ordinary Heroes in Extraordinary Times, Static, Government, Liars, Media Cheerleaders, and the People Who Fight Back, The Exception to the Rulers, Exposing Oily Politicians, War Profiteers, and the Media That Love Them, and her latest book, also a New York Times bestseller, which is called Breaking the Sound Barrier. It, it uh, describes the power of independent journalism in the struggle for a better world. Inspirational reading for many of us. Amy also writes a weekly column. Um, it's syndicated by King Features, and you can see it in many papers across the country. She was the, the last award that I, that I want to read that I think is a, that speaks to, to my state of mind is she was also honored by the National Council of Teachers of English with the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contribution to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language. So thank you very much for coming, Amy. Welcome. Thank you very much. And it's a real honor to be here, to be talking about women and girls and education in Afghanistan. In fact, I just finished my column and ran over here. And today, I was writing about Afghanistan. Um, what is the status of girls' education in Afghanistan today? How do Afghan parents educate their daughters? What are the options available to them? Um, we know that the quality of life uh, for women and girls is a big determinant of how a country will develop, uh, what options, what hope, what possibilities there are, and so what an important issue to address today as we in this country deal with the longest war in US history. Uh, that war in Afghanistan. Um, what an illustrious group of women to introduce today. Uh, we're going to start by hearing from Zema Korsun Neff, uh, Deputy Director of the Children's Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. She's going to talk about the attacks on education and advocacy efforts to protect educate and talk about how to protect education from attack. Um, she will be followed by Anita Anastasio, Senior Education Advisor with the International Rescue Committee. She lived in Afghanistan for 12 years, is fluent in Dari. She'll be talking about work directing a community-based education program in Afghanistan, the one that our next speaker, Professor Dana Birdie, studied in Afghanistan. Um, it's innovative design, collaboration with communities and government. Dana Birdie will speak next. I assume some of you are her students, others her colleagues. Um, Dana is Assistant Professor of International Education here at New York University. She'll be talking about her research that shows how these community-based schools increase enrollment by almost 50 percent 
and eliminate gender disparity between girls and boys. A different model than we're used to hearing about in the media and reading about in oh, international best-selling books. Um, and uh, Wegma Batur is our just flew in from Afghanistan, Wegma Batur, uh, who is Program Quality Development and Learning Coordinator for Care International in Afghanistan. She just flew in from Kabul. She is a resident of Kabul. Um, she'll be talking about her current work in Afghanistan and the way forward for girls' education. We'll start with Zema Korsen Neff. Well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor to be on this panel with so many women who I really um, look up to. Um, and to be with all of you who have come tonight to talk um, about an, a topic that is um, so important and has um, been covered in so many different ways over the last 10 years and yet is um, an issue, the education of girls in Afghanistan that very much um, remains under threat today. Um, so I want to introduce our session first um, by giving a picture about where girls' education is um, today, including um, a number of barriers to girls getting an education that makes it more difficult for girls to get an education, but also um, poses particular challenges for agencies um, such as CARE and IRC and um, others we'll hear about tonight in providing education to girls in Afghanistan. Um, and then I want to turn to uh, the issue of targeted attacks on education, on schools, teachers, and students. Um, and in particular, discuss the recent decline in attacks and suggest why that may not be quite as promising as it seems. Um, and conclude by flagging um, some very immediate challenges for girls' education in Afghanistan, but also talk about um, an exciting um, global advocacy effort to protect education in armed conflict, both in Afghanistan um, but elsewhere around the world. So first, the snapshot. Um, as you may know, in 2001, there were very few children in school in Afghanistan. Um, about three quarters, of a million uh, three quarters of a million children, according to the World Bank, very few girls. By comparison, last year in 2011, you may know that school um, in most places hasn't started up again in 2012 in Afghanistan, but last year there were about 7 million children who were in school in Afghanistan, about 37 percent reportedly of whom were girls. Now, you have to take these numbers with a very large grain of salt. There hasn't even been a recent census in Afghanistan, but it sort of gives you the big picture that there have been enormous advances, um, and that's, that's the good news. Um, the less good news, or probably the bad news, is that more than half of all girls remain out of school in Afghanistan, according to the Ministry of Education. Um, and when you look province by province, there's even more variation. So in a province like Herat in western Afghanistan, um, you have about nine girls to every ten boys in schools. When you go to provinces in the south, such as Zabul, you have about one girl for every ten boys in school. When you look at secondary school enrollment, the numbers are, are quite low. Um, in 2009, um, net enrollment rates for girls were only 13% in secondary education. So the big picture is um, very significant advances, but millions of children who are still missing out on an education in Afghanistan and need that right to education provided for them. This is due to a variety of barriers, and barriers that really hit girls harder than boys. The first is poverty, that girls' labor is needed. There are also a variety of informal fees associated with going to school, like school books. When a family has a very limited amount of money to, um, to spend on education, um, they are likely going to educate their boys before the girls. Um, distance schools are often very far away. Combined with a shortage of girls' schools, there are in fact fewer girls' schools in Afghanistan than boys' schools, um, which is particularly perverse given the fact that distances disproportionately affect girls. They have a greater impact on girls. And Dana is going to talk more about this. Um, early marriage, most girls in Afghanistan, more than half of girls in Afghanistan are married before age 16 and are typically unable to continue with school afterwards, especially after becoming pregnant and having children. Um, there are poor physical facilities, and according to Oxfam in 2011, 45% of girls they surveyed said that their schools didn't even have a building. Um, many schools also lack water and toilets, which as you may know is an especially difficult burden for girls when they become older. 
There's a shortage of female teachers. 31% um, of teachers were female in 2009. There's particularly a shortage in rural areas. The quality of education is quite low, and I've talked with um, parents who said that after three years of sending their child to school, they still couldn't read, and this really decreases the incentive of parents to spend um, money and time on sending girls to school. There are also negative attitudes about girls' education, um, also, also described as culture. But I would just caution you against, uh, against assuming that this is the only barrier without taking into account all of the other barriers that keep girls out of, out of school. Um, as a woman um, said to me from a women's group in Kandahar, while culture is an issue, security is more important because even those people who want to break tradition are not able to. So while you may, you may hear people oversimplifying and saying Afghan women or Afghan parents don't want to educate their girls, um, in fact, parents may be p facing a very pragmatic choice of do I send my daughter to walk a very long way in insecure conditions to reach a school um, with a broken down building or no building at all to be taught by male teachers and then after three years she doesn't know how to read. Um, it's often a very rational calculation. But that leads me to security, which is the barrier that I want to spend um, most of the rest of my time on. Um, noting, of course, that all of these barriers you know, interact with each other and the distance and, and security. A school, literally across the road, I visited a school that was across the road from a home where parents said it was too far because um, a grenade had been left in that school. Afghanistan has, as you may well have read in the media, um, a serious problem of targeted attacks on schools, teachers, and students. And while this is not a new problem in the country, um, there was a dramatic upsurge in Afghanistan in the mid-2000s where schools were bombed and burned, schoolgirls had acid thrown upon them, teachers were threatened and killed. Um, my colleague collected a um, so-called night letter, a threatening letter in Afghanistan in October of 2009 that was left for a teacher who then quit her position. The letter was signed with some Taliban insignia and it read, we warn you to leave your job as a teacher as soon as possible, otherwise we will cut the heads off your children and we shall set fire to your daughter. Schools are targeted for a variety of reasons. They're targeted in some cases because of who they educate, in some cases girls. They're targeted in some cases because they are a symbol of the government, often the only symbol of government in the community, and they make a convenient, soft, or unarmed target to attack. They're sometimes targeted because they provide what is perceived as a Western or secular curriculum. And they're in some cases targeted out of criminal acts or, or local disputes. Um, Human Rights Watch's research and others have found that the perpetrators are Taliban, but they are also others. And we documented cases of schools being attacked in areas that were at that time entirely under the control of the government. Um, but there's, there's no question that, that many of the perpetrators are, or have been Taliban. And in fact, in December of 2006, the Taliban leadership um, included in its code of conduct for field commanders instructions to attack schools that didn't abide by Taliban rules. And the effects of these attacks has, has been dramatic. The Ministry of Education reported in 2009 that at least 800 schools that had been functioning were closed and hundreds of thousands of children who had returned to school were no longer attending school, but had dropped out. The attacks were often very unpopular with local communities as well. Much of my work from 2003 to 2006 involved documenting, exposing the phenomenon of attacks on um, education, trying to press um, governments and other actors in Afghanistan to acknowledge the problem and to develop a more strategic response. Recently, there has been a decline in these targeted attacks. Um, according to the um, Afghan Analyst Network, in fact, they have nearly ceased, though that's of some question. Um, and they attribute that um, initially to local negotiations um, by communities with local commanders starting in 2007 and onwards, um, but believe that there has actually been a change in national policy by the Taliban um, in the last couple of years. And in fact, um, the clauses in their code of conduct on attacking schools was dropped in 2009. Um, and in 2011, the Taliban was publicly announcing um, or denying responsibility for attacking schools and saying they were not opposed to girls' education. In return, um, in some places, the Ministry of Education has changed the curriculum, um, has allowed Taliban vetting and placing of teachers, placing their own teachers in schools, and allowed them um, to exert considerable control over certain state schools that are funded by um, the government. 
The facts on these negotiations are, are not well um, established, and of course there is a, there's a lot of variation among different commanders in different areas. The Taliban's command and control is not, um, not extremely tight. Um, but um, there is good evidence that, that there was change in ministry policy in exchange for a decrease of attacks. There is real question about what this decline means, and you may have read in the media, um, um, you know, a, a lot of a, a lot of you may have read a lot of attention to this decline, which um, has um, allowed um, many students to return to school, according to the data. But there are real questions about whether this is um, a real change or simply a way for the Taliban to exert control over communities and build up popular support. And real questions about when the curriculum is changed. Um, what kind of substantive content is left in education. Um, I'd like to suggest that as attacks are declining, there are three significant challenges ahead for girls' education, or at least, at least three significant attacks, um, particularly in light of the planned drawdown in international troops and the handover of security to Afghan security forces. The first is um, there, there is and there will be a steep decline in aid. Um, what will happen with girls' education? Will international donors protect it? Will there be ring fencing around certain programs that are indispensable for Afghanistan's future? Second is with, without taking a position on to, troop withdrawal and peace negotiations, um, we have deep concerns about general security in Afghanistan and in particular accountability for abuses by Afghan security forces because accountability is currently non-existent and these include abuses against women. Um, and general insecurity, and in particular, um, abuses by Afghan security forces will certainly have an impact on women's and girls' freedom of movement, including their ability to attend schools and to teach at schools. Um, and, and I would suggest that, in fact, um, as security is handed over to Afghan security forces, that girls' attendance at school will actually be a key indicator of whether or not there is security. It's a quantifiable key measurement of whether um, an area is secure. Third is, um, has to do with peace negotiations. And as these negotiations are taking place, my, my question is, um, who is the advocate for, for human rights but for women's rights? Where will be the voice at the table protecting girls' education? Um, and, it, and at present, um, that's, that's a real question. Um, in conclusion, I, I want to leave you with the, with the thought that there has been tremendous progress for women and girls, and particularly for girls' education in Afghanistan. Um, but there are real ongoing threats and pressing questions about the future of um, education in Afghanistan. But my second point is um, that we have learned a tremendous amount about overcoming barriers, particularly in an environment where schools, teachers, and students are under threat. Um, this is crucial not only for the ongoing security climate of Afghanistan, but um, there has been um, some interesting advocacy developments elsewhere. Um, and a number of actors came together, I think in part motivated um, by this dramatic phenomenon of targeted attacks on schools, teachers, and students in Afghanistan, and began to realize that this wasn't a problem just limited to Afghanistan, that in fact in conflicts around the world, education is targeted not simply, it's not simply a casualty of conflict, it is intentionally targeted as a tactic of conflict. And in 2010, seven organizations, joined by an eighth later, came together to form the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack, or GCPA. And it is an international advocacy coalition dedicated to protecting schools, teachers, and students in armed conflict. Um, it brings together actors in the areas of education, child protection, human rights, um, and actors that, that were in many ways sort of coalesced by, by the problem in Afghanistan, realizing that this is a widespread problem that demands a global response. Um, I want to conclude with the words of, of a mother who I interviewed in Kandahar. She had um, five daughters going to school and one boy. And she said to me, I regret not being educated myself. I'm happy that my children are being educated. Education is good, but security is bad. When there is security, I will not prevent my daughters from doing anything. I will take the brunt of people's talk. I will take it personally because I want my daughters to be something in the future. And I think, I think the testimony from this mother illustrates um, 
at a very individual level why education is so important for Afghanistan's future and without ensuring girls' education, the future of Afghanistan is um, in jeopardy. So I want to turn um, the podium over to Anita who's going to talk about a particularly successful program that is providing girls um, like the daughters um, who I interviewed um, with an education and with a future. Thank you, Seema. Um, she's uh, set to stage, and I want to welcome all of you. I'm very, very happy uh, being here and able to talk about a model of education that is very dear to my heart. Um, I have personally witnessed this, and so I'm, I'm really happy to share um, my accounts um, of um, what we have done. And um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, a model that has been successfully used to increase girls' education. Um, and um, where it, how did it start? And how it has evolved? What achievements have been made using this model? And what challenges remain? So that's kind of the talk um, today. Um, I want you all to go back. You know, we know seven million girls, uh, seven million uh, students are in school today in Afghanistan. Um, but I want you all to go back um, to the Taliban times. So, think about 1990, 1996 to 2000. Um, I was in Afghanistan then, and while I did not um, invent this model. Other people did. Um, it was actually at the request of communities of parents who came to organizations like CARE International and the International Rescue Committee to say, you know, um, we know that the Taliban do not want girls in schools. Um, but with that, our boys aren't going either because no one pays attention to schools. So. Um, Please help us open up schools for us. We will do anything for our children to be educated. Um, and with that, organizations like CARE and DIRC um, started what is now known to be a community-based model. I will call it community schools. Um, and it really relied on parents and it relied on community uh, members um, to to, to support this. Um, we did not have a lot of money during that time. Um, so one of the first things that, um, you know, to see that there's real will of um, parents to send their, their girls and boys to school was to say, okay, how do we do this? We will not build schools. So it's not, we are not building school in this, in schools in this model. We are asking parents if they have a space that they can um, provide. In addition, we also don't have teachers, so we've asked, you know, who in your community um, can be a teacher? And there aren't many female teachers, and even though this is one key barrier for girls accessing school, um, we've been successful because um, if parents are okay with selecting one of their literate men, in the community, then that can continue and, and girls are allowed to go to school. So um, having teachers being selected by um, the community was important. And then a third part that we also did not want to start was supporting the teacher financially. And um, we asked communities to compensate. And because they were so interested in the education of their children, um, they compensated the teacher in one way or another. Many teachers worked for nothing. Many teachers, other teachers would get um, compensated, not necessarily by financial means, but by support. Someone would work on their field, etc. cetera. Um, as organizations, um, we provided, for us the focus, of course, was to provide teacher training, really working with teachers, trying to um, set in place quality education. At the time, no curriculum was in place. So um, we really developed, um, you know, what, what do you teach in grades one, two, three? Um, and we provided resources because we wanted to make sure every child can go um, and does not um, get prevented from entering because they have no money to buy their, their, their school materials. And those organizations during the Taliban times um, worked very independently 
primarily very much relying on communities. There was no Ministry of Education really in place. Um, and while this is not a great number, I think, you know, just testimonies to um, organizations like CARE and DIRC, 34% of students were girls during the Taliban times in these schools. Fast forward, 2002, Taliban are gone. Um, so one of the, um, before I do that, I wanted to actually show you what these schools looked like during the time. So you'd see some of the settings, right? No school building, it's in someone's home. Um, here are the girls. It could be a tent. Um, we had girls being educated in tents. Um, very basic um, places for girls um, to be educated. Um, and you know, many of these pictures have been taken now where there's many more girls in school. So fast forward, Taliban are gone, we are in 2002. And as Zema said, um, there weren't many, many children in school, less than a million. Um, and one of the first tasks that the interim government did was of course lift the ban on girls' education. That was one. And then the second one, they didn't have enough time. They had three months to get schools up and running. Three months, because in March 2002, the new school year started. So they went out and mobilized resources, and everybody was behind them. Of course, UNICEF was there, USAID was there, and many organizations. And um, you know, I think this was a huge effort, reopening these schools and getting girls to school, and I don't know how many of you have ever heard back to school campaigns. That was uh, what, what was the campaign. And three million uh, children enrolled in 2002. Three million children. Now back to school is, is, is a phrase that is probably very misleading because many of these children had never been in school, right? So three million new students, many of them new students. Um, the government at the time, and the Ministry of, the, uh, of Education at the time, was very much interested in getting schools built, rebuilt, um, getting textbooks edited. Um, and there's a whole issue around why they needed to get those um, textbooks edited. So um, they were concerned with pretty much getting teachers ready and many more teachers because three million, they where, where to get those teachers. And um, in addition, um, organizations, NGOs um, started and continued working what they had always been doing. And CARE and IRC and others continued to use a community school model to expand further access because that's been successful and many more girls could go to school. Um, 2004, the constitution, a new constitution in Afghanistan uh, was developed and, um, and for the first time um, recognized the right to education. And not only did it recognize the right to education, it actually said that the state will provide free education up until a university level. That's incredible, right? How many countries provide free education until university. So it's incredible, but at the same time, it's, I don't know, stupid. <laughs> because as we know, this is not a resource-rich country. 90, in 2002, 95% of the money that came to Afghanistan came from foreign aid. So how is this government ever going to achieve um, free education for all? But they declared it, and now they have to go through with it. Um, and just to say, um, to date, the total government budget for education is 7%. And that includes foreign aid. That's not a lot. Um, just to say that NGOs, during the times and up until about 2006, continued to support the government, but support in a very uncoordinated manner. We all have to be honest, it was uncoordinated. And um, I think having a um, new minister that came to um, the front in 2006, um, who was 
both uh, an ambitious politician, but also a very pragmatic man. He knew that he could not do education alone. He wouldn't, you know, Millennium Development Goals, he would not be able to have his ministry be the only one um, providing education. So he, and he knew the power to harness support because he has been an NGO person himself. So he recognized that NGOs could actually um, do support the ministry to eventually reach all of the children. And um, his appointment coincid co coincided um, with a new program that, you know, before all the NGOs were working alone, but I think um, even before this new initiative, a number of organizations actually came together and said, we need to do this better, we need to coordinate better, and let's work together, we can, we can mobilize more resources. And in 2006, four NGOs, four international organizations, CARE, the International Rescue Committee, Aga Khan Foundation and Catholic Relief, Relief Services um, received USAID funding. And it's one of the few funding that actually provides a bit longer term education money. Most of the money that we've received in the past were one year or two years. How can you set up an education system in this way? So we actually were very lucky to receive five million, uh, five year um, funding, continuous five year, fu five year funding um, to support the government in increasing education with a particular focus on increasing um, education for girls. Um, the four organizations, the, the, the project is called PACE A, Partnership for Advancing Community Education. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very lucky um, because I was um, appointed as the director to run this program. And Wajma um, was a very dear colleague. I used to work for CARE, <laughs> and Wajma still is. Um, we used to, we worked on this program very hard, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm truly, truly privileged that I was part of that program. Um, call it coincident or lack, um, that you know the minister started at the time that Pace A started. But I think one of the visions that the partners of, the, of Pace A had was, you know, this model needs to continue. We can't just um, run it and we will always support it. Eventually, this is not going to work. The ministry wants to provide education. And parents, what we have heard over and over when we were in the field, parents said, you know, it's great that you do all this. It's great that you now run these schools. But you know, we hear there's a constitution. And we hear that the ministry says it's providing education for every child. Um, and we want that ministry education. We do. <laughs> um, so, so eventually, we knew we needed to hand it over. Um, so with, I think with the great leadership of the Ministry of Education and a minister who was um, willing to um, put all of this education, the, de the various systems that existed under his authority. Um, and, uh, you know, we were able to, I think, move forward of really envisioning that these schools slowly are, are taken over by the Ministry of Education. Um, and one of the key, I think, key things that he made sure that were in place by 2007 is what is called a community-based education policy endorsed by the ministry and recognizing for the first time that community schools are de facto public schools of the government. And I think that was a really key achievement for us to, um, um, to make that happen. Um, and I want to show you a little bit of this policy outlines the vision of the government as well as I think of many organizations. It's still, it's a policy. <laughs> and uh, partners like Pace A um, and others are, are, have been working very hard with the ministry to make that policy um, um, a reality. Um, I just want to highlight a little bit of like what this looks like. And, you know, sorry for, um, it's a cluster model that the ministry envisions, right? And what they are saying is one of the conditions for you, for an organization like IRC or CARE opening up a school is that we have to go through an education shura. And a shura um, is the diary word for council, a council of um, 
partners uh, like uh, the, the provincial education department, district education department, community elders, mullahs, um, they form part of, a, of an education shura in a district. And we are now in, in kind of a cluster of villages. And there isn't government school. There is a government school. But the next villages are all far away. And very few children actually access this. And Dana, Professor Dana will, will talk about how important reducing distance um, is to, to getting girls to school. So we are allowed to open schools, community schools, if they are three kilometers um, or more away from the government school. And so government school, you've seen it, CBS, community-based school. Um, so let's say we have established those schools. And we have established P PTAs. Does anyone know what PTA means? Parent Teacher Associations. Everyone has them here in school. We have them there too. Um, and SMCs are what um, community schools equivalent of a PTA is called. So what the ministry envisions is that there is a cluster. And um, those CBSs, those community schools, are turning over into outreach schools of the government. So they will continue to exist where necessary. And it will be a cluster that is clustered around a, a public school. And we provide education, and the principal of the ministry school goes and observes and monitors. I used to run this thing when I was training district education officials and our own colleagues, and so I like to show that <laughs> once yeah. in a while. But that's kind of the, the vision. The students of the community schools are going to be registered by, um, with the government schools. Teachers are going to be registered. Textbooks, supplies will be distributed to the bigger school through which these outreach classes, that's what they are called now, um, are receiving their books, are receiving salaries, et cetera. That's the vision. And we are far away from, from, from doing this. Um, within the PESE program, we clustered, we tried very hard, and we clustered over 500, um, cl we, we created 500 of those clusters. I'm, I'm almost done, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so just, just to say, um, I want to I want to leave you with highlights of what we have done in those five years when we worked there, um, and and then some of the challenges. Yeah, is that okay? Good. <laughs> okay. So by April 2011, this project stopped last year, finished last year. We had um, enrolled 89,000 children in over 3,000 classes across 91 districts in 19 provinces. That's peanuts when you think of seven million students, right? It's nothing. Um, but I think it was quite substantial because we are actually working in very, very remote areas. 64% of those students were girls. So that's impressive. I mean, when we think of that seven million, 37% are girls, um, that's an impressive um, rate. And I think this is also what made it, what, what changed the, um, how, how should I say, what changed um, the attitudes in the Ministry of Education that we could actually show that we have 64% of, of, of girls in schools. The other thing I think that's a great achievement that since 2006, we handed over schools every single year to the Ministry of Education. And by April, over 69% of schools were integrated. Um, and the remaining schools that we could not integrate are continued by organizations like, um, like ours. Um, and I think the last point in terms of achievement is that the government has recognized this model, wants it, and um, has even requested now um, the fast track initiative of the World Bank um, to support community schools in the future. Challenges, that's my last one. <laughs>
challenges with this model, and I'm sure Dana will talk about this too, and Washman will talk about this. Challenges with the model is if you have a teacher who is um, barely educated himself or herself, which in many of, I mean, 40% of our teachers had not had a sixth grade education or lower. Um, how do you continue this education? You know, it's okay to start grade one, grade two, grade three, but then what? How do you continue? So that's a, that's a major challenge that everyone grapples with. How do we get our teachers to the point that they can actually teach beyond grade six education? Another piece is space. And as you've seen where those schools are taking place, these are not the, the easiest places, right? We still have kids in tents. Um, so another piece is to, to think about how, um, what could be a permanent space? We, again, I don't think it's necessary that we build beautiful schools, but we should build something, something permanent that exists in these, in these communities because girls won't go to the school if it's more than three kilometers away, and Dana will talk about it. And then I think the other piece that's, that's still crucial is that the Ministry of Education is still weak. I mean, the capacity um, and what we've been seeing of once we hand over a school, we need to stay there with them for at least a year and really work with them to recognize that the quality that we have provided needs to continue to be provided because many parents, as Zema said, um, will take their children out if it's not uh, if the investment that they have made doesn't come true and these kids don't learn. So Anita is very modest. I hope you realize that because she and Wajma, along with a number of other people working on this program with them, were responsible for doing what some best-selling books have described others doing. They actually carried out, they actually provided education to girls across Afghanistan and did it very successfully. And I'm going to tell you about my study that um, examined the impact of this program. So um, this, is the, this is the map again you see, just to orient you a little bit to Afghanistan. Um, the, place where I carried, the places where I carried out research were both Panjshir Valley and Gore Province. The place I'm going to talk about today is, the, is Gore Province, where I carried out most of the data that I'll discuss today. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be brief, and I'd be happy to discuss further and take questions after. There's also a paper you can read if you're interested. So um, first, the history of the study. I was interested, when I started thinking about this kind of, this research project that I wanted to carry out, I was really interested in understanding how international NGOs provide education in countries affected by conflict. I was really interested in these, what they call education and emergencies programs. It seemed to me that there was a lot of discussion about how they worked, but there was not a lot of understanding of the kind of impact that they had and the f how effective they were. So when I first launched the study in Afghanistan back in 2005, when I carried out the pilot study, I actually thought that I would be doing a post-conflict study. That I was a little bit naive, but at the time, 2004, 2005, Afghanistan looked a little bit different from the way it looks today. Um, so what I was, as I said, what I was interested in understanding was the impact of these kinds of programs. I was coincidentally in Afghanistan where PACE A won this grant to conduct, to provide community-based schools across the country. So I was able, in fact, to convince Catholic Relief Services, which was one of those consortium organizations that I worked most closely with, to randomize where they put the community-based schools that they were going to be providing in Gore Province. What that means is that I, told, I asked them to let me know where they were planning to put all of their schools. And because they did not have enough money to provide all the schools in the first year, they agreed to randomly, to let us, the researchers, I worked on this, I actually invited an economist, Lee Linden, to join me to do this um, randomized trial study of these schools. And they, I, I said, you know, let us randomize where you're going to put the schools in 2007 and 2008. So everyone will get schools. Don't worry about that. But we'll be able to test the impact on children, households, and villages from the first year to the second year. And to their credit, Catholic Relief Services agreed to this proposal. 
And I should also add, I also like to, I always like to tell audiences whenever I speak about Catholic Relief Services that they are a non-proselytizing organization. And most of the staff who work for them in Afghanistan are actually not, not even Catholic. Most of the staff, of course, that they hire in Afghanistan are Afghan. Um, so, oops. Don't spill water on your computer, at least <laughs> anyone's computer. Um, okay, dangerous combination. So, um, as I was saying, some of the other questions that I was interested in understanding, when I, when I was interested in, in the effectiveness questions of this program, I was also particularly interested in knowing if parents would send their children to these schools. So the questions at the time were really, you know, were parents, would parents think that these schools were some Western intervention and they wouldn't want to send their children? That was one of the open questions. Another open question was if they sent their boys, would they be willing to send their girls? And then another open question was, if they send their boys and their girls, will they learn something? These are the questions that we wanted to test. We also had secondary effects questions, which I can talk more about after we're through, uh, during the Q&A if you're interested. But their primary education questions were those. So, um, so what we actually did was we hired, I, I spent quite a bit of time going back and forth at that time between New York and Kabul and Herat and other parts of Afghanistan, Gore province. But we actually hired a team of 20 Afghan surveyors and trained them in standardized interview research. And they actually carried out an education census of the villages in our sample. Our sample, our total sample was 31 villages. And they surveyed every single household in every single village. And they tested every single child between the ages of 6 and 11. They gave them tests in math and language, Dari. And we designed those tests based on the government curriculum because we wanted to test the children for what they were learning, not something that we thought they should be learning or anything else. But we actually tested what they were learning. These were first year schools, for, as I said, for children between the ages of 6 and 11, primary school. And um, we also mapped GPS coordinates. So we took, which was, uh, I, I don't think it's something we would do today in Afghanistan. It's a little bit risky um, to take coordinates of, of uh, houses and schools and um, other kinds of things in a country where, uh, where there's conflict and there's aerial bombardment. Luckily, that kind of conflict was not happening in Gore at the time when we were working there. So the primary source of conflict in Gore at the time was intertribal conflict. It was less, there, were, there, were not, there was a little bit of Taliban influence, but not much where we were. So we were able to gather this GPS data, which actually allows us to show the distance that each child lives from a school, a government school, and a distance where they live from community schools. And in addition to that, then we can show decline or increase in achievement, depending on which school these children attend. So <clears throat> I should also point out that um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think I mentioned the total sample size. We had about um, 1,500 children um, in the sample. And it was incredibly difficult to carry out the study for a whole variety of reasons, which you can imagine. Some were security related, but other we didn't, others we didn't expect, like weather. It was a, there was a record bad snowfall in 2007, in the winter of 2007 in Gore province, and all the roads were closed. You, we couldn't reach any of the villages we were trying to survey. So we encountered a lot of difficulties, but we actually were remarkably able to complete the data collection. And now I'll just tell you the, the key findings from the study. First, we found that when you put community-based schools in these villages, children go. In fact, it increases enrollment by about 42 percentage points from what it had been before. So keep in mind that children had been accessing schools before. They had been walking long distances to go to government school. So long dis when I say long distances, I'm not talking about from here to um, the Empire State Building. I'm talking about um, a walk that is four hours in one direction for some of these children. And when they arrive at their destination, school, they are taught for two and a half hours, because that's the school day in Afghanistan still, also for community-based schools. So they would spend seven or eight hours to get two and a half hours of instruction time. Hmm. 
So some children had been ask, accessing school for in a number of different ways. Either they were walking long distances, mostly boys were doing that, or some of them were living with other families and attending school in that way. But what we found was when we put these community, when CRS put these community-based schools in these villages, enrollment in increased overall to close to 80%. The second thing we found was that girls' attendance increases far more than boys' attendance because boys were already accessing school more than girls were. And girls, the gender disparity between boys and girls, <clears throat> excuse me, is virtually eliminated with community-based schools in the villages. So the gender disparity that exists without these community-based schools was essentially eliminated once schools are available to children in these villages. We also found that distance has a significant effect on academic outcomes, so that enrollment and test scores, I mean, just to, just to um, crystallize this for you, enrollment and test scores fall by 16 percentage points and 0.19 standard deviations, respectively. Okay, so enrollment falls significantly and also the test scores fall significantly with distance to school. But distance affects girls much more than it affects boys. So it's, it falls by 19 percentage points for girls for every mile that they have to walk. For every mile girls have to walk, enrollment falls by 19 percentage points. And of course, test scores fall as well. So we finally, the, the last point that I want to make that I think is the most important to understand this program and the meaning that it holds for Afghans, for Afghan parents, and for Afghan girls. The most important point to understand is that at this age, Afghan parents are equally committed to sending their girls to school as well as sending their boys to school. They make no distinction at this age. There's a common misperception in this country, I think, and in many other parts of the world, that Afghan parents are e more eager to send their boys to school than they are to send their girls to school. In fact, in our sample, in this part of the country, we can talk about generalizability afterwards, but it, it, and we, we believe it to be true in many other parts of the country, Afghan parents make no distinction when you correct for distance. When we control for distance, there's no distinction. So the last point I'll make is that this is wonderful. This is a wonderful program. It has remarkable results. We've shown that to you. Anita has talked about it. I've given you the, the data behind it. But what happens after primary school? Primary school isn't good enough in many parts of the world. Primary school is good enough to get young girls into school in Afghanistan, but what do they do next? Wajma's gonna talk about secondary school in Afghanistan. Thanks. Oh. Yeah. I forgot to show you the chart that shows the distance that I was describing to you. There. Yeah, enrollment and location, there you go very graphic representation of what happens to attendance and enrollment, excuse me, to enrollment when distance increases. This is for boys and girls both in this chart. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, I'm feeling very much honored being with you all. And also, I would like to say thanks and extend my appreciation to New York Abu Dhabi University uh, who organized this event and also sponsored this event for advancement of girls' education in, Afghan, in Afghanistan. I am, as a mother, having a daughter, and also as an Afghan woman, appreciate a lot uh, your initiative. Uh, I'm here today, I would like to uh, talk about my experience involving an education sector through Care International in Afghanistan, and uh, also talk about, as Dr. Donna said, what next after primary education for girls. 
uh, Kier International in Afghanistan uh, for first time 17 years back on 1994 launched a home-based school pilot project and uh, after four years during Taliban regime the project is expanded as community-based education in another eight provinces of Afghanistan. And I have been involved with the education sector of Kiara Afghanistan on 2003 as uh, coordinator of the program. And the program uh, since that time up to now uh, included a wide range of approaches through uh, addressing education, uh, different education project beneficiaries uh, by implementation of a variety or different activities. Uh, the main activity of our program is community-based education, providing basic education from grade one to nine in very remote areas of Afghanistan. And uh, as Anita showed in a slide, all the primary education uh, like activities are uh, same because uh, it, is, it is all based on good experience and also success of IRC and CAR community-based education. And uh, has uh, other um, like respected uh, speakers, they talked about like uh, Zama about situation about challenges and Anita about primary community-based education and Dr. Dana about her research and finding uh, that what, again, I would like to say what next after primary education for girls. Boys can go to long distance to attend the schools, but girls cannot go because of number of barriers that I will uh, talk. Uh, same time on 2006, on 2005, uh, when uh, KIAR and also IRC and other two partners, CRS, and including education program of KIAR, were uh, designing uh, the PC project. I was member of uh, designing of PC project and also designing of lower secondary community-based education for girls. Uh, I was, and uh, because we received demand from communities in host province. Uh, as we started the first project of community-based education in primary level in host province, and we had graduates from grade six. And at that time, the parents and the students were just demanding that how we continue, what we should do after grade six. We should get married or uh, should stay at home. What would happen with our the six years education? At that time, finding donor for uh, this project was not easy because all the focus of the Taliban regime was on primary level through government and also through donors. Mm -hmm. Luckily, at that time, we had a private donor interest. Uh, his name is uh, Dusty Hosher and his family uh, he just was asking us about something new, not the same primary education. And then uh, for design of project, having uh, requests from communities, from hosts, we designed the project of lower secondary community-based education. And the donor was very much involved with us in design of the project. And in 2006, same time when we started the primary education PSA project, we started the lower secondary community-based education as well in host. The context for lower secondary education in Afghanistan is so like uh, awful than primary education because uh, just 10% of uh, eligible girls to be enrolled in uh, lower secondary community-based, uh, lower secondary uh, schools, they are enrolled in the school. And most of them are 
and urban schools. Uh, like example, Kabul and big cities like Herat and Bach. What is the problem because of, um, for not enrollment of girls in secondary schools? The problem, big problem is not having secondary schools in remote communities of Afghanistan. The problem is that the girls cannot attend the residential schools in urban areas from remote areas because of social and cultural barriers. Also, not having enough qualified teachers, especially female teachers. In Afghanistan and any other conservative uh, communities, m more uh, parents are feeling comfortable that their young girls to be taught by female teachers. And this is a big challenge in Afghanistan. Also, the barriers and the challenges towards girls in primary level getting more magnified in secondary level, like safety, security, distance, having boundary walls for, in the, uh, for the schools, sanitation, and also uh, uh, needs of young girls to be at home and help to the mothers for housework and also mm, taking care of uh, a small brother or sister. Here, secondary model brought the school to the communities, to the students and female teachers to their own communities, where the issue of safety and security somehow solved. But still, the social pressure continues. The model somehow same like primary community-based education. Uh, the first like uh, um, activity of the project was as establishment of community-based education committees, school management committees, which. Uh, the representative of the communities, teachers, mothers, uh, district education officers, and also uh, students themselves, they are uh, representing their uh, uh, schools and students uh, in, the commu in the, this community shoras or school management committees. Uh, the, this committee is a very much powerful identity in the community because they are helping the uh, project for uh, identifying of teachers, selection of teachers, and also day-to-day -day monitoring of the um, school affairs, and supporting the communities to, and the schools to uh, the parents become able or be mobilized to send their daughters to the school. Also, teacher uh, training, capacity building of teachers, and methodology and also in academic subjects, how to teach and how to teach the special subject like science subjects. As Anne Hanita said, that most of the teachers are graduated from grade six, grade nine, uh, but we were lucky that we found most of our teachers graduated from grade 12 for the uh, secondary schools. Para professional training is another supplementary activity for this project. Besides uh, normal uh, Ministry, of Econ Ministry of Education curriculum, the students have been taught how to play a role as basic health educators in the community and how to become a teacher after graduation of grade nine or uh, grade 12. This is something uh, help uh, to the capacity and also employment opportunities for the students when they graduate. Also, the library corner for the students, for the schools, it's another initiative for this project. 
and also having science labs. This is also a model in Afghanistan. Even in our formal education system in urban areas, we don't have libraries. But these schools are equipped with the small libraries and also uh, labs. Like 60% of la library books are for uh, students, 20% for teachers, 20% for community. And all that um, books uh, just selected by close coordination with the students, teachers, and community representatives. Now, I would like to uh, uh, share with you the uh, impact of the program after six years. Based off uh, success and achievement of the project in host province, the project expanded on 2007 to Paktia province. And we found an institutional donor OSHID funding for that. Then, on 2010, the project expanded in copies of province of Afghanistan. And again, we found a private donor funding for, by name of Janet Ketchum for this project. Now, girls working as community health educator in host province. Girls working as teachers for primary level uh, grades. Age of marriage increased. In Afghanistan, when the girls reach to age of 12, 13, 14, then only marriage is happening. But as these students are in the education process, the uh, age of marriage increased, and they didn't got marriage on early stage. Also, the age of first pregnancy increased, which is a problem in Afghanistan. Also, girls are being involved in community council shuras. Because uh, on, uh, since 2010, the project facilitated the CARE global initiative by Signature, by name of Signature Program Power Within, to build the capacity of these young girls uh, to be uh, their skill in leadership and decision making. We established a number of peer groups that within the students, with involvement of teacher, community showers, and even uh, district education offices, which is a great achievement. Also, I want to leave it with that, that uh, and when we designed the project, we never thought that these students will be graduated from grade 12 this year. Because of not having high uh, education, high uh, schools in province of host, but, as, uh, but with the close coordination of uh, project team, community support, and also the district and provincial education offices, with the model of community-based education, CBE, and uh, the slide that Anita just showed you, with clustering system, with uh, um, Ministry of Education, high school, which is four high school, were, um, were there at, uh, like two years back, we become able to, uh, with close coordination with Ministry of Education and provincial level, just in Hub School of uh, Ministry of Education, these uh, schools of community-based education and secondary level uh, recognized as a, uh, like a um, branch of uh, main Hub School. And uh, after grade nine, when they reached to grade 10, we integrated them to the uh, provincial education high schools. <coughs> we just continued our monitoring and also a little bit technical support. But the rest was run through community and also district and provincial education offices. And this year, 206 girls graduated from grade 12. At the startup in 2006, we enrolled 300 girls. But during, uh, after graduation, some like 10, uh, uh, students drop out 
Number of them after graduation from grade nine or 10, they become a health educators, they started work. A uh, number of them started as a teacher to work with primary education and also a few of them got married. But it is a great achievement after that. And also just recently, 119 students applied for university interns exam. And they will continue their higher education. And this is, I'm feeling very much proud on behalf of care Afghanistan, behalf of communities that uh, these students are living there, and behalf of uh, students themselves. And this is a big achievement. But still, uh, with this, like, uh, a small project in three provinces, just we cannot say that challenge is finished. And still, there is a big and also long way of challenges towards girls' education in Afghanistan. And we will see that what will happen because of politics and also insecurity in Afghanistan. Uh, but uh, as an Afghan, uh, still I have hope, and also we have support of you great people. And uh, let's pray for peace in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask, um, and any one of you could take this question, and thank you for your excellent presentations. How does Afghanistan compare with other countries? Um, uh, well, I mean, in, in, in general, um, access to education is very low by comparison um, to many other countries. But when it comes to the problem of targeted attacks, I mean, um, the rates are extraordinarily high. That being said, um, Take, setting aside the issue of conflict, I mean, UNESCO has documented, for example, targeted attacks in more than 30 countries um, around the world. But, but the numbers in Afghanistan, for example, um, in 2008, according to the, I believe, the Ministry of Education, there were 670 education-related attacks in Afghanistan. That's just extraordinarily high. Um. So in terms of I, what I think, uh, in terms of um, comparison and the issue of girls' education, I think it's a global issue. I don't think it's necessarily just um, a problem in Afghanistan. We see this um, in Africa all over. Um, it's continuing. It might be not necessarily the barrier, might not be distance, although I can imagine in many of the communities that's the case too. But um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a global issue and not just in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Also, I would like to add that uh, what is the difference between Afghanistan uh, education for girls and other countries, that Afghanistan is unique because of uh, uh, passing uh, long years of conflict and internal wars and continuous conflict uh, in, in inside Afghanistan and from outside Afghanistan through neighbors' countries. And also, during five years, uh, years of Taliban regime, all the education sector collapsed in Afghanistan. And suddenly, after fall of the Taliban, uh, like unrealistic enrollment of uh, students, especially girls as well, in Afghanistan, um, year by year, like one million, two million, three million, and now reached to the seven million. For access, yeah, this is a good achievement, but for quality, still it is question. And still we can see that uh, because of conflict, there is a number of issues. Security is a big issue. We can deal with culture, with social barriers when we have peace, but with this ongoing conflict, it is a big challenge. And that is the question I wanted to ask about, which is, war. Uh, you talked a lot about the Taliban attacks. What is the effect of U.S. soldiers there? And if U.S. soldiers were not there, how would that change? I think I'm not, I'm not sure that any of us has an answer to that question. But I think that um, 
the sentiment towards the Americans has shifted, clearly shifted over time. So in 2005, Americans were still seen very positively. And the situation, circumstances in Afghanistan were very different from the circumstances in Iraq. The two are often compared, but in, on, this, uh, uh, on this point, they're very different. Um, Americans were welcomed in Afghanistan initially. Afghans were exhausted after so many years of war, and they were excited to, to see that the Americans were coming potentially to create peace and stability in the country. Now, since that hasn't happened, uh, there's a lot of anxiety about which side people should be on, especially when the Americans are leaving. So um, I would say, and Wajma should probably speak to this and could speak to it better than I, but um, sentiment has turned toward Americans in many parts of the country, and um, particularly toward against, against the military more than it had been previously. Um, would you like to speak to that at all, or? Um, I think we covered it. I covered it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and does anyone else have a comment to make about that? Yeah. Just to say that um, uh, the Afghan government's ability to deliver security um, should involve looking at whether or not it's secure enough for children to attend. Um, school, but we, um, you know, at Human Rights Watch, are, are deeply concerned um, about the prospects for se uh, for security, and particularly, I think it's very important that, um, for example, that Afghan security forces be held accountable for human rights abuses, including human rights abuses against women and girls. And I would add one more point that um, Zima alluded to in her presentation. We also. I think agree on this panel that one of the indicators for stability is whether or not people can access education. This is something that um, forces might consider when they discuss the degree to which the, the forces have had successes in Afghanistan, is the degree to which girls are able to access education. It's a very important indicator. And so given that you said that the mood has changed and shifted against U.S. soldiers, would you say that it would help the country for them to leave as soon as possible or not? This, this is an issue that um, is, is very complicated for women in Afghanistan. And if Wajma feels comfortable speaking to that point, maybe I'll ask her to tackle it. I'll put you on the spot. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Last year, uh, with uh, World Bank funding, here did a research on attack on schools. Because uh, you have already maybe aware that number of schools attacked by anti-government people. But the result or the research uh, outcome shows that the most of the schools which were PRTs or army people were involved on that for the building or construction of school, that schools, those schools were more attacked. But the community-based education schools were not attacked. This shows that like dear the like the US soldiers, they were helping education sector. But this was the mentality of uh, black uh, people by like um, like uh, mobilization of anti-government people that to be against of the, that. And this is politics. Always it is happening. And it is out of the control. Because when two uh, sides are in fighting in each other and be in against in each other, the soft target is education sector, always. In the past also it showed during uh, first 10 years of the war, second uh, decade of the war, and now, when we have like more than 34 uh, countries present in Afghanistan for support of the countries, but still it is going on. And uh, for future and transition period, I cannot judge now. I can, I can maybe add, I was in Afghanistan in December and um, you know, just talking to colleagues and, and dear friends of mine, I would just say, I think there is, you know, it's, 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 it's very hard to say. I think um, if there was peace with an end of US soldiers, um, I think people would be happy to have them see leave. But I think there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of what's going to happen. And it's not just that, um, you know, the forces will leave, 
it's also that the money will leave. And I think Seema um, hinted at that, which is another, um, you know, I was at the Ministry of Education um, in December speaking, and you know, people are worried of, you know, we've been relying on this money. We don't know how to do it. As I said, there's a constitution that says we have to provide education for all for free. Um, how are we going to do this when we don't have the revenues? Um, we don't we don't have enough revenues. Um, we want to be sufficient and we will be. And I think, you know, anyone wants to see the forces leave. But I do think there is um, there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of what happens afterwards. So. And then, because the way most people in the United States understand education in Afghanistan is through Greg Mortensen's book, I mean, it's just straightforward. Um, and you took this on, uh, Professor Birdie, in your in New York Times op-ed piece. I do think it's important to address the different um, model, why you s directly feel what that model is and what you feel the problems. I mean, you have presented it through your research. but. What is that model that people, if they haven't read the book, they just hear? How many people in the room have read um, Three Cups of Tea? I'm curious to see a show of hands. OK, not, not as many as I would have expected, actually. Well, I think what's really, what's really good about those books, Three Cups of Tea and its um, sequel, Stones into Schools, what's really good about those books is it, got, it brought attention to education in the region. And it brought people's attention, certainly people in the United States, it brought attention to the fact that Afghan parents want to send their girls to school, which I reiterated multiple times, as you saw in my presentation. So that, I, I think that point deserves um, as many reiterations as it's received and more. And to bring that kind of attention to the issue is critical. What concerns, what concerned me were two things primarily, and I, I could talk about sub points of those two things as well, but I'll start with those two. One is that it was a misrepresentation to some extent of um, how education was used in that region. In other words, um, the book's uh, Three Cups of Tea um, describes itself as fighting the Taliban one school at a time. Um, but in fact, the areas where it just the areas where the schools were built in that book at that time were primarily in the northern areas in Pakistan, which were peaceful and actually not connected to the Taliban at all. So I think it, the problem with um, confusing the issue in the eyes of the public is that the public begins to trust the author who presents um, this very compelling issue in a very compelling way with a very compelling story. And then the public realizes, oh, you know, the, the, the dots don't actually connect. And in fact, there are some, um, there are, are some um, angles of the story that weren't represented in the way that most people thought reality was. So the problem with um, muddying the waters in that way is, is that um, then organizations that are doing remarkable work in providing education to girls in some of the hardest to reach places, some of the places that Wajma referred to, host province and Paktika, and um, CARE works in some of the most difficult provinces in Afghanistan where, they, where they've implemented this program. It makes donors feel a little bit concerned and maybe take, take a step back from this kind of international aid and consider, uh, start to have concerns about whether or not it's happening in the way organizations say that it is. And that, that simply um, is, it's unfortunate, it undermines the, the um, primary issue, which is to provide education to girls. The second point, I guess I did go into some of my sub points, but the second main point is, of course, building schools in a place where schools are under attack is not necessarily the right approach at the right time to providing education in this region. The most important thing is to provide education, not necessarily to build schools, not necessarily to provide photo opportunities for um, um, many, many outsiders who want to be seen as having provided um, a building to a community. But those buildings, in fact, have become targeted. Some of them have become targets for um, Taliban. And not. And I should, I should be specific. Um, it's not clear how many of Mortensen's schools were targeted, but the model was certainly targeted in places across the country. 
Do any of you want to add to what I've said? <laughs> and would anyone in the audience like to ask a question? Yes. You, if you can speak as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, how do you, as researchers and aid workers, maintain security for yourselves while you're in Afghanistan? <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe I can just say, um, you know, I think we're often asked that question, um, but the thing that um, that really keeps me up at night is the security of people um, we're interviewing through Human Rights Watch, and I, I think. Um, um, that especially in a place like Afghanistan, people take enormous risks to tell their stories. Um, and in 2003, 2004, 2005, the story of attacks on school teachers and students was uh, not a story that was being heard and not a story um, that many people wanted to hear. Um, and um, I think when we're doing our work, the security of the people who are telling their stories um, is um, you know, is one of the most important um, considerations, and protecting their security, and not putting them at risk, is um, you know one of the real challenges of the work. Yeah, and I just um, would like to add that I think in, in most cases we very much rely on um, our colleagues, our national colleagues in the field, when they say, "Please don't come with us," um, you know, because we could be a target or this could be a target, then we don't go. Um, so, you know, we have clear security rules, you know, clear security protocols, and if we break those, we are sent home. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and again, I think in a context like Afghanistan with what's happening um, these days, you know, even those security policies don't make a lot of sense because you just, you know, if you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, then that's you. Because you cannot, the, the types of attacks that are happening there are just not um, things that you can control, right? And just knowing that is, um, and, and being realistic when you go and just say, you know, things can happen, um, but I'm still willing to take that risk. I, that's every person's own kind of responsibility. But we do that, you know. Of course, we, we are briefed all the time. When I go back to Afghanistan today, I have 48 hours, within 48 hours after arrival, I have a phone in my hands, I have a radio in my hands, I have received security um, orientation of what's been happening, what's the situation, etc. cetera. So, um, but yeah, I don't travel much um, these days than I used to, <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> The other point I'd like to make about that is that, in fact, the burden has shifted away from international aid workers to national aid workers. So, in fact, the casualties and the, casu the casualty rates that you see now are higher among national aid workers than international ones, partly because the international aid workers are so sequestered. And also for uh, national staff as well, um, we have security protocols and we uh, more rely on communities uh, um, like trust and also reporting that when they say don't come today, maybe uh, something happened on the way, uh, then we, we are not going. And also our organization more paid uh, focus on safety and security of the staff. We are not putting the staff on risk. And uh, we are we sure that we have community support and be sure about security of our staff, then we go and uh, implement projects there. Uh, but something, uh, uh, sometimes it is out of control. Something may be happened during on the way of two provinces, when you go from one province to another province, and usually it is car travel. And uh, um, uh, sometimes, Anything can be happen, and it is out of the control. But we have tried our best to provide safety and security measures to our staff. I mean, Dana, your whole convoy was attacked when you were doing one study. Could you describe what happened? Oh, um, yeah. We we did face very serious security issues, and of course, when you're doing research and you face security issues, you ask yourself lots of other questions. You're not. Um, providing food to people who will die if they don't receive it. You're actually studying and 
a program. And of course, I fundamentally believe in studying humanitarian aid. I think it's crucial. If we don't study humanitarian aid, we don't know how well it works. We, there's a lot about um, the way it's received that we wouldn't know if we didn't study it. So I think it's essential. But I certainly lost a lot of sleep over um, managing this team of 20 Afghan surveyors who were um, out collecting data. And they did, in fact, encounter, they came under attack at one point in a, in a sub-office. And um, they were, in fact, um, six armed men with Kalashnikovs and rocket-propelled grenades attacked the compound. It seemed, and it was in the middle of the night, it seemed as though they were not interested in injuring anybody because there were men sleeping outside who were rounded up and they were brought inside. The, men, the armed men shot up the vehicles and they shot RPGs from the compound out towards the village. So it seems to have been the case that we were caught in, a, in the inter-tribal conflict that I mentioned earlier. Luckily, the staff was fine. We were very, very, very lucky. It was remarkable, in fact. Um, but it, it is one of those risks that many people who are working in Afghanistan have encountered. We were very lucky that nobody was injured. Is there really a possibility for them to go to university so far away from home, or is it still culturally inappropriate for them to be either living on their own or having that experience? In Afghanistan, uh, the um, level of uh, social uh, pressure and cultural pressure is different from province to province. Mostly, the south provinces are more conservative. Uh, in central provinces, it, it, is, it is improving, and in north, it is better. Like, and also in big cities like Kabul, Herat, Balkh, uh, city of Kandahar, uh, also, um, uh, these are, and Bomia, they are the main provinces that uh, when the girls, <coughs> like, uh, passing or graduating from high school, they can find job, and also they can, as a, like, example, like as a teacher like government worker. Uh, but there is high possibility of their enrollment in universities. Because uh, in recent <laughs> years, as much as uh, attention paid to the um, like um, uh, education from grade one to 12 or primary education, uh, the efforts have been done for higher education as well and university level. We have now at least one university in big cities of Afghanistan. And uh, for some, it is depend to the families also, how they think about their girls, and how they think and can fight with social barriers. And they can send their daughters to residential universities to the cities. And uh, it is different. It is different. It is more depend to the mentality of parents. Yeah, so many, many universities today actually have boarding schools. So, and, and boarding schools segregated for girls, for boys. Very strict, um, and very strict rules in those boarding schools. I um, was able to, um, to work actually with a group of students uh, during my time years ago. And, and so I know how strict um, you know the rules in the in those um, dorms were, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and and you know parents. Um, I think not every parent would, or not every father or mother would necessarily agree to send their girls to university. Um, but many, I think, see the kind of like they see the investment, hopefully being paid off if they do. So I think. That's why we have 109, what, 100, 200, 206, or 119 entering. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you spoke about the importance of, or rather the effects of proximity in terms of performance and even attendance. I have an industrial design background. The first thing I think about is transportation. So um, is there an opportunity, or will there be an opportunity in the future for some sort of transportation infrastructure, for instance, community-based volunteers driving kids back and forth to school, because even though less than three kilometers community-based school is still a long distance to travel, 
Um, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. It's something that I'm also sort of thinking in my mind about opportunities for design. Yeah, and I, I can actually answer that. Um, one of the partners within the PSA consortium, um, the Aga Khan Foundation, received funding to actually test that. And they has, have started, and, and I'm not sure, Vajma, what you heard, but they have started kind of using, providing transportation. And probably transportation more for kind of the upper grades and maybe um, lower secondary or high school education than, than, than the lower grades. Are there international standards for what's considered primary education? And if so, do the CBEs and ministry schools comport with that standard, or is there a significant variance? Yeah, so again, I think um, worldwide there's probably very, you know, there are variations. Um, many, many countries that, that I work in. Um, when they talk of primary education, they talk of grades one to six. Um, some countries talk of grade one to eight. Um, but usually it's kind of six years of like the first education, not, not including preschool education. Um, and your second question? What does that include? I guess, what, is, what, what does primary education mean besides a certain class range or age range? Again, I think every government determines what um, what competencies um, children should be, um, you know, completing a primary education. So I don't know what what this is in in the United States um, when you have elementary school. So it's kind of similar, like elementary school to then going into the upper um, schools, so middle school and high school system. But just to say about international um, standards, in case there are any other lawyers in the room, um, there there is a right to education guaranteed in international human rights law, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, which has been ratified by every country in the world except the United States and Somalia, um, which hasn't had a functioning government since the treaty went into effect. Um, and um, so you can actually look at concrete international human rights standards about what is the right to education and what does that entail, including being available, accessible, and appropriate. So. Uh, it, seems like, it seems like everyone at the beginning stressed the importance of security and then seemed to shift forward downplaying the impact of coalition forces. <laughs> um, NATO has a heavy presence in coast and Hakika. What impact did that have on selecting that region? And then what impact did it have on the success of the secondary program there? Uh, our uh, project, we have, we are running community-based education at primary level and also in secondary level and host province now. We are not anymore in practical. Uh, but uh, we are not uh, in touch with NATO and uh, army system. Uh, as per our uh, policy, our organization policy, we are not involved in uh, politics and any partisan activities or uh, get side of anyone. Uh, we are working uh, directly with the communities where security allow us and our staff and where we have support of communities for running of the schools. Uh, we are not involved with not. But again, I, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, but at all, uh, we can see that uh, as much as the NATO and also the Afghan army and police be more empowered, then the, uh, it, it's facilitate a good environment for the schools as well, because of having peace and also safety and security. I, I just wanted to add to, um, to, um, to the discussion around um, NATO. I think again, you know, as, as Vajma said, we, as non-governmental organizations, we really um, try to stay away from armed forces um, as much as possible. That said, if there are attacks um, that are happening in those areas, um, um, we we have um, you know we have to have we've had to close schools. We have had to um, stop um, going, and and you know Vajma mentioned. Um, Sometimes communities call us and they would say, please don't come because there's like major movement happening. Or we hear off the radio that, you know, the US is attacking a certain area and we have to, we, we just stop. Um, now these schools can continue because there are 
you know, they are in someone's home or they are in a mosque or so. Uh, they might close them down if they if, if it's really getting um, very dangerous, then they, they don't send their girls or boys to school. Um, so um, that's fact of life that we, we all deal with, I think, mm -hmm. as organizations, as governments. Yeah. We're going to take two more questions. Um, thank you for the presentation. Everybody offered something very um, interesting and unique. Very much appreciated. Um, but coming from more of an economic standpoint, I was you, you had hinted at some gender segregation in the workforce. And I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more context of um, the current economic environment and kind of touch upon two topics. One, like what opportunities for women with higher levels of education are there past getting education when they enter the workforce? And second, if the CBEs at all focus on um, trade or entrepreneurial skills, um, and if that's not a component, is that something that you're discussing? Um, uh, just uh, in Afghanistan, uh, after uh, like um, announcing of the new constitution in Afghanistan, uh, all and also uh, national uh, strategic plan for the country uh, five years back, each uh, ministry, uh, sectarian ministries, started to uh, just translate the national uh, big level of the planning or the strategy to their own sectarian ministries. And uh, it came at, at all in Afghanistan in uh, constitution and also in national strategic plan that uh, considered the gender role, mainstreaming the uh, women's role in the development of the country uh, for employment, uh, for uh, work, uh, like, uh, equal to uh, men in Afghanistan. And also, it was pushed uh, through donor communities, through government, and uh, um, still it is going on. The government and also donor agencies and head agencies all are trying to push this agenda. And uh, when, like example, uh, when we, um, it is in government system now also it is, they are practicing and also through aid agencies as well when we are announcing the positions and uh, we are saying that the qualified female are encouraged to apply or sometimes just announcing of the position to, uh, for female. Uh, in this way we can increase uh, the number of employment for uh, women and also internship opportunities. Uh, but still having uh, qualified uh, female who be graduated from here bachelor degree or master degree or PhD degree, it is it is challenging because because of early marriage, because of social bar barriers, and also after getting married, having between four and six children and cannot be able to work, and also mentality of husband. That is still it is it is it is husband decision that the PhD professor uh, woman should stay at home and looking after kids. This is this is all the challenges. But uh, at all the agenda is pushing in the country. Uh, even uh, it is uh, now it is must to have a gender advisor in each organization, if it is government or if it is aid agency or it is donor or UN agencies. Uh, this is even in police, in uh, army, we have gender advisors that they are encouraging women's involvement. Uh, and uh, also um, the big things that c should be encouraged in Afghanistan is uh, just to uh, increase the literacy rate. Still, it is as much as it's the women are working, on another hand, the literacy rate is getting higher. It is, this, this portion is not touched well still. And also we can see a good sign of involvement of women in, um, like in uh, legal procedures in Afghanistan. It is, it's, it is a big achievement. Involvement of women in parliament. We have a high number of women in parliament. We have women as ministers in Afghanistan. And I think this kind of high development and employment in Afghanistan 
it is high achievement. Even in some development countries, we don't have three ministers who will be women. Uh, this is the situation. Yeah. Last question. Um, so would you say that Karzai is supportive of education and, and women? And, you know, what is the sense in Syria among the people of his role and how he's doing? I think he's very supportive. Um, I, you know, again, I think there there are a number of challenges, and I also think there's, you know, change doesn't happen overnight. Um, there are generations of generations of what, you know, what the role of women in this society is. You can't change that overnight. Um, so I would just say that, um, you know, I've seen. I think there's probably far better opportunities in urban areas for women and diversifying um, that, it, that it's not just teachers and doctors or nurses. Um, so you see a lot more, you know, you see women in the media, you see women being journalists, etc. cetera. Um, it's harder, so much harder to think about, so what could they become in rural areas? And um, and so it's, it's a challenge that will continue, I think, I think one of the reasons why we push for longer term education is um, simple effects that it has on, you know, health outcomes for children, mortality rates, etc. Right? We know that if, if 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 mothers are educated longer every year is is you know, you increase their, the health status of their children. So that's one of the key reasons. Yes, not to forget that yes, ideally we would every we would want to have every woman be productive. Um, but it is a challenge in a context where um, it's not so, you know, women don't necessarily work outside their homes. Um, and again, I, I'm saying that, and I shouldn't say it, because I think um, the country is so, um, so, so different from place to place that you do see women working in fields in some areas and you don't in others. So I think um, it's, um, you know, it, it takes, it takes time, and I've seen um, remarkable progress just alone being in, in, in Kabul, in the capital, and see how many women are now in the workforce. Um, so. Maybe I, I saw some students are mm -hmm. really, really eager. Yes, so maybe yeah. one last, <laughs> one last <laughs> question. Which one? Okay, I'll be really, Hero. really quick. Uh, I have a question in terms of quality of education, like. Earlier you mentioned the teacher, teacher training, like good trained teachers, what are they doing for teacher training? I can answer that very quickly. So who teach uh, teachers are trainers. Um, many, you know, every Ministry of Education probably has teacher colleges that's all over the world. Um, they have professors who teach teachers, <laughs> who train teachers. Um, so we have, you know, former teachers who have been teachers for a long time. Um, we select those. Um, we look at um, how they teach. We test them, and then we train them up as trainers to um, to then uh, support teachers. Um, and because it's very challenging in a country like Afghanistan, where right now I think 166,000 teachers. Um, are teaching and I think 82,000 more teachers are needed to reach all the children. Um, you know, how do you do that? How do you train a force that hasn't been trained for a long time? Um, so, you know, we sit down and we discuss this and, and talk with other organizations and talk with the, the colleges, the Department of Teacher Education to see how do we, how do we get at least some, uh, trainer, some teachers trained. And the ministry has actually a national program for in-service, what they call in-service teacher training for all the teachers that have that are currently teaching. And you know, we use a lot of um, school break time, so um, teachers are invited to come during school break because we don't want them to even miss out on the few hours they teach every day because it's not enough. Um, mm -hmm. Just. Uh, using the moderator's um, privilege. I'm just intrigued by something that you said before about the concern, the reason, perhaps the primary reason for wanting, being ambivalent about U.S. troops leaving is that you lose the money. And that's very, very important for so many of these programs. 
And because you're speaking here in the United States and policy is determined presumably by all the people here in this room and weighing in on US policy, if that money were guaranteed, maybe this is a fantasy, that same amount of money, um, so that that was taken out of the equation or something for people to fight for, not just troops coming home, but money remaining there. That's often not talked about. It's the troops come home or that's it. Would then the feeling in Afghanistan, and Wedgman, I'm very interested in your responses to be different? Would it be weighted toward troops leaving or not? Is that not the only? If you could continue to get the amount of money that your country is getting, however pitiful that might be, that amount of money. Uh, this is a big concern now, uh, when, because the, as you said, the money in Afghanistan linked directly to the troops in Afghanistan. And uh, it, show, it, it, it is like uh, we can see some sign of uh, that uh, if the troops leave, the amount of support also will be decreased mm -hmm. to Afghanistan. And this is a big concern for Afghanistan. And uh, this is a different advocacy, uh, like um, initiative has started to talk with donors even uh, before Bonn Conference and also during Bonn Conference, uh, and also uh, to talk with donors that, uh, that yeah, if the troops leave, that what will happen with this country? Because it still needs are there, especially if we talk for education, yeah, it is huge need. Uh, and also another concern is the uh, sending or also transferring the support or the fund uh, to directly like 80 percent to uh, government and through that to the uh, people or to the communities to benefit from that. It is also a big issue uh, that how much government will be able to manage this. And uh, this is all the concern. Still, it's, I, I don't have exact response for that. Yeah. And, and maybe just to add, I mean, maybe the question is not so much are the are the uh, are, uh, international troops going to be withdrawn, but rather in the deals that are going to be struck, um, will there be um, uh, a trading away of women's rights, including um, girls' access to education? Um, and in the future that follows that, will there be security that allows um, women to teach in schools and girls to get an education? And to me, what is um, so striking from this presentation is how um, critically important the kinds of strategies that have been described tonight um, in providing education to girls in um, an insecure and highly challenging environment, how critically important those strategies will continue to be in order to meet um, the unmet demand of so many women and girls um, in Afghanistan to get an education.